cool. Um, so really excited to be joined by Lachlan Kirkwood, um, who is going to be talking us through today um, how to get started in Bubble. Um, so that I think is going to entail some some core concepts, uh, use cases, and just understanding like how you can um, get started in the best possible way. Um, and hopefully the eventual path to becoming some form of, of power user over time. Um, so thanks so much uh, for being here, Lachlan. Really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll just pass it over to you um, to kick us off. I know at the end we have some questions, um, but uh, yeah, over to you, you Lachlan. Perfect. I'll just share my screen here. Um, just one thing I want to note is I apologize if, um, so as Max mentioned, this will kind of be like a bit of an intro into bubble. There will be some talk about how you can eventually become a power user, but I apologize if you are like Kelly, a little bit into bubble. Some of this is going to seem pretty obvious to you. Um, but hopefully there will be some sort of valuable, uh, context that you can get out of it. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be running through everything to do with bubble. Um, as I mentioned kind of before our talk today, um, I, kind of started my NOCO journey only using Bubble and have continued to use it over the years. Um, so I've watched it really grow over the past couple of years into, I mean, it already was such an incredible platform, but it's only getting more powerful by the day. Mm. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, so as I mentioned, I started using Bubble in 2019 and much the same as all of you, I had an idea in my mind and I didn't really know the difference between code and no code at that given point. I mean, I spent weeks, months, if not years, trying to find a technical co-founder to help me build out a product idea that I had. So I was wanting to build the Dribble for digital marketers. If you're not familiar, Dribble's like a LinkedIn for designers. I wanted to kind of build that for digital marketers. I was a digital marketer myself at the time. Um, and then I discovered across Bubble and no code and the whole community of that. And I absolutely fell in love overnight. And, I just felt so empowered as a maker, someone who was um, just felt so incapable of what I could actually create. I mean, I'd always hack together like little WordPress sites with Zapier and stuff like that, but I'd never actually built anything like completely responsive, like a web app before. Um, so when I found Bubble, yeah, I absolutely fell in love. Um, and then from there, I kind of was fortunate enough at the beginning of last year to actually team up with the Bubble team as a um, content marketer. And we got to write the how to build blog series. So I'm not too sure if any of you guys have seen that before, but essentially Bubble approached me at the start of the year, right before the pandemic. Um, and I wanted to create a list of blog posts that talk about how you can rebuild popular products out there like Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, um, essentially kind of like what Makerpad was doing, but specifically for their tool set. Um, so I set out, I wrote about 60 blog posts, I think in total over the space of a couple of months and each blog post just ran you through the step-by-step -step process to uh, rebuilding some of these popular products um, using Bubbles tool. Um, and then throughout the end of last year, around about September, um, Bubble took me on as their community manager for Twitter and Facebook. So I essentially just run their social channels there. And then in 2020, I started my own business building with Bubble. Um, which ironically is just a video series of the blog post that I wrote. So I would always get messages from people in the community talking about how they use my blog posts to create apps in Bubble. But then I started having people messaging me asking um, if they could pay me to create videos of these blog posts. And I just didn't know it was a possibility until I had so many people reach out. And then I realized, hey, there might be something here. So um, the start of this year or end of last year, I've started recreating all of my uh, how to build blog series as a um, series of video tutorials. Um, so the easiest way I would explain it is honestly, it's the maker pad, but specifically for bubble. Um, so I just run you through how to rebuild uh, popular products out there like Airbnb, Instagram, Indeed, Fiverr. And the reason why these have been so popular is because if you're like myself, when you start joining no code, um, you have an idea for a product that you want to build. And by this point in time, it's really hard to come up with a completely original idea. So your app might have, let's say a pricing algorithm like Uber or social posts like Instagram or booking features like Airbnb. So people themselves don't actually want to rebuild an Airbnb competitor. They're aware that that's kind of being done and it's a very competitive space. Um, but what they want to do is build a specific micro SaaS for their niche. 
and that could include those features. So that's why they're interested in learning these particular uh, video tutorials. So in today's session, I want to just run you through um, five uh, particular areas. The first is just running you through what is Bubble for anyone who is brand new. Some core concepts that really helped me learn Bubble's platform and that I think will be valuable to you. Um, some tips and tricks for beginners. Uh, the path to becoming a power user, which I think is quite an important one. And then some additional time for Q&A. And of course, you can always message me after today's session if I don't get time to answer everything. So a bit of an overview as to what Bubble is. If you haven't yet had the chance to actually dive into the tool, you obviously most likely heard of it. It's one of the bigger players in the market. Um, but essentially Bubble is a tool that allows you to build dynamic web and mobile apps. I'd probably put more focus on the web side of things, not so much mobile. I'm aware that there's other tools out there like Adalo, which are specifically for mobile apps. Um, but essentially the massive benefit to Bubble is that it's an all-in-one solution. So I look at makers out there who use tools like Webflow and Airtable and Zapier, and they glue all these tools together. Um, that to me sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> I really don't wanna have to pay for three different subscriptions as a maker, particularly if I'm just validating my idea. Whereas Bubble is an all-in-one solution. So it allows you to design your app. It gives you control over creating a custom database to store data for your app. And then it allows you to visually create logic, which is just workflows um, as they call them, all within one app. So you don't need to rely on any other tools. That being said, you do have the flexibility to integrate through their API connector with third party tools. So you're not limited by any beans. Bubble itself is still quite, I guess, complex in comparison to other no code tools. It certainly does have a bit of a steeper learning curve. And that's because Bubble really is a visual programming language. You still have to critically think like a traditional developer as to the ways that you will run your workflows. And you'll quickly find that they can get quite complex based on what it is you want to achieve. So it certainly still does require a, a bit of level of critical thinking. Um, but that being said, it's much easier than learning to code. I mean, I've tried to learn to code like 10 different times in my life failed miserably every single time, but I absolutely loved Bubble as soon as I found it, just because for someone who is a bit more visual like myself, um, it was much easier to pick up. So a couple of use cases for when you should use Bubble. So I'm here today to talk about Bubble. And of course, I'm probably only gonna tell you good things because that's the only tool I've used. But if you've got a product idea in mind or you're thinking about making the change, I really just wanna highlight why you should use it for what specific use cases and when you should not use it for other specific use cases. So I think that if you are planning to build a dynamic product, um, Bubble is the go-to platform. And the difference between a dynamic product and a static product is a static product is something that, think like a WordPress website or a portfolio website where the content doesn't change that's actually hosted on that website. Um, I find that tools like uh, WordPress, Wix, Squarespace, they're great tools for building static websites that are responsive and fast. Whereas Bubble is more for building web apps, as I mentioned. So these are kind of applications where you dynamically need to display different information, particularly to different user accounts. So think anything like a social network or a SaaS application. Um, and it also, Bubble allows you to um, give a sense of control to users as to what is created on that app. And that again is the difference between a dynamic app and a static app. You, people who are viewing your static website or your static application uh, won't be able to essentially really make any changes to that based on their preferences. Whereas in a web app, they'll have full control over what it is that they can create using your tool set. So just a couple of use cases for Bubble that I would really highlight, um, particularly if you're thinking about building something similar. Um, this is definitely what the, well, the right tool for the job for you. So if you're building anything like a directory, a marketplace, a social network, a software tool, um, or an on-demand service, these are just a few examples. Um, Bubble is definitely the perfect tool for the job in your case. I know there are other tools out there that specialize in specific like individual use cases. But Bubble is really just, honestly, it's one of the most robust tools out there that highlights um, or gives you the flexibility to choose between them all. Some instances where you shouldn't use Bubble. Um, this is kind of the only instances I've come up with in the past couple of years from seeing it is one, when you're building static websites and landing pages, I get people that ask me all the time if they could build just a like portfolio website in Bubble. And while you can do that, um, it's not the best tool for the job. If you've used Bubble before, you'll know that the responsive design engine 
isn't as intuitive as something like uh, Webflow or even just like Elementor and WordPress. There's definitely better tools out there for the job there. <coughs> Another instance is not um, using Bubble for game development. Um, I know there are other tools out there that um, allow you to build custom games, but Bubble's essentially not really for that. Um, aside from that though, I haven't really come across too many other limitations purely because Bubble just allows you to integrate with so many other tools and services. So for things like messages, video applications, um, whatever you're integrating, Bubble can really expand its capabilities. So the core concepts I wanted to focus on today. So if you're considering using Bubble, if you're oh, sorry, or if you're new to Bubble, these are the four things that you need to take out of today's session. And this is the reason why I believe Bubble is one of the most powerful tools out there because it includes all four of these particular concepts. So that's the database, the design canvas, the workflow editor, and also the third-party integrations. So I just wanna take the time to run you through and give you some examples as to how you can use these particular um, concepts or uh, tools within Bubble. So within Bubble, the first thing I wanna talk about is your database. And the reason why I chose to talk about this one first is because I believe before you even start building an application or you put an element on a page in Bubble, the first thing you need to think about is the architecture of your database. Now, if you haven't used Bubble, this can quickly seem overwhelming if you're already having to start thinking about building a custom database, but I assure you it's much easier than it sounds. So in Bubble, the database is broken into two separate fields. There's what's called a data type, and then there is a data field. Your data type is the overarching thing that you would like to create within your database. And then the data field is the list of options within that data type. And I'll show you a graph in a moment that'll explain that in much more detail. But the other benefit, and again, I'll be giving you a demo on this in a moment, is the ability to relationally connect different data types and fields within each other. So that way you can truly create a relational database within Bubble, which I know you definitely can't do in some other tools. So this is just an example as to what the custom database creator looks like within Bubble. So you, when you're creating your data types, you need to create the overarching things within your product that you would like to create. So this is an example here where um, this is kind of like a freelance marketplace. If someone was creating uh, this particular product like Fiverr, they would create a user data type because there'd be users who need to obviously log in and create accounts within this platform. And because they're creating account, that means we're creating something. So it's a data type. Then there is a list of services that people might list. So if someone says, hey, I'm a social media marketer, I wanna list that as a service on your platform, uh, that would be another data type. And the same goes for the products there. And then within these data types, so let's say here we've got our user data type, we could add in a list of all the relevant data fields. Now these data fields are the things that belong to this particular data type. So for every user that I register in my platform or every user that signs up an account, I could store all of these different data fields within that one account. So for instance, I could identify like what their account type is. I could allow them to add in a bio to their profile. I can store their credit card ID. That's through a Stripe integration. I could store their location as a geographical address. And of course I could store their name and the list goes on. You can honestly store as many different data fields as you would like, although we'll talk about some best practices in a moment. But Bubble allows you to store things like files, addresses, images, uh, text properties, lists. Um, but I also just wanted to give you an example as to how you can start to create your own database if you are considering Bubble. So I'm gonna give the example of an Instagram clone here today, because again, I think it just makes a lot more sense when you start talking in terms of products that you already know and use and you're familiar with. So the, let's say some example data types for our Instagram clone, um, just two off the top of my head that I had here was you would have a user data type because users would need to create a profile on your platform. And then users would create a thing within your database, which is an Instagram post. Then within both of these data types, you would add the relevant data fields. So for every user, once again, you would store their name, their profile photo, their handle. And then for every post that's created, you would store an image on that, a caption, 
and then a like count. So you can now start to see how the data fields will be nested within each data type. <coughs> the other big benefit to Bubble, as I mentioned, is that you can create relational data fields. So let's say in our user data type here, I would like to store a list of all the posts that have been published by this user. Now, the reason I'd wanna do that is because when you go to a user's profile, you'd wanna see a list of all the posts that they've created across our platform. So what you can do in Bubble is you can create a data type that is storing a list of posts that have been published by this user. And then that would obviously store our separate data type, which is a post. And I could link every post back to this particular user. So on the user's profile, I could simply just add an element that chooses to display a list of posts that have been created by this user. And because these link together nicely, I can intertwine the data fields that are connected between the two. So if I was to give you a quick example, and I'm just gonna jump out of my presentation here and jump into Bubble. I've just got a little bit of a demo that I wanted to give in terms of creating um, your own data types and fields within Bubble. So just going off the back of my Instagram clone um, example that I was giving you, if I wanted, I could head into my data tab here. And if you're not familiar with Bubble's UI, this is how everything is built. So if you head to your data tab here, you'll see here, this is our option to add data types. And then there is our data fields within this data type. So I can already see here that we have our user data type stored in our database. What I could also do is add in the data type called post. I'm just gonna unselect that setting there. I'll create that. Another data type I could create is a comment because users on our platform would also be creating comments when they comment on posts. So I could add in another data type called comment. And then within these data types, I could begin to add the data fields. So let's say for our users, I wanna register their names. I could type in a data field called name and I will update the field here and I can choose from a list of all these different properties that Bubble allows you. In this case, I want the name to just be a text field. So I can select to add that to our database. Now, I apologize if I'm running through this quickly. I'm just wary of time, but of course you can come back and watch this at any given time. I could also store, as I mentioned, a profile photo for this user. So I could select that this field type will be an image and I will create that. But let's say I want to store a list of all the posts that a user has created, as I mentioned before. What I would need to do is link our field here to our post data type. So the way I would do this is I would select to create a new field and I could call this published posts. And the field type will easily be able to link to all of our posts in our database. But because a user will post multiple posts, they're not gonna just post one post, um, said post a million times there. They're not gonna publish one individual post on their Instagram profile. They're probably gonna post thousands over the period of their time in our application. So what we'll need to do is select that this is a field here with multiple entries because we'll be storing multiple posts under this user. So I can select to create that. Then on our post data type here, I can also begin to add some additional data fields that are relevant to this data type. So in this instance, I could, sorry, I could add an image, which is the actual post image itself. And this would of course be an image field type. And another field that I could add is a like count because people will be liking this post. So I obviously wanna keep a count of that and store a list of all those users who have liked that post. And the way I can do this is by creating a new field, I'll call this likes. And the way I'll be storing likes in an application is by storing a list of all those total users who have clicked the like button, which in our workflow editor, which I'll be showing you in a moment, we can easily add that user to this list. Now, if this sounds a bit confusing, it'll make a lot more sense when I show you a demo in a moment. But for this list of likes, I would like it to store a list of users. So I'll select the user field type. And then as I mentioned, this is a list because thousands of people could like this one post. So I'll be selecting that this is a list with multiple entries. And now because I'm linking this post data type here for our likes over to a user property, let's say a 
user would like to see a list of all those people who have liked their profiles. And then I'd like to display all of those users who have liked that post. And I'd like to display their profile photo as well as their name. Because I'm storing a list of users, this field type will also link back to our user data type, which means at any given time, I can pull out those users' names, their profile photos, or any other information I have stored within this data type. I'll just jump back into my slides here. So that's just kind of a bit of an overview as to a database example. Um, I will give some other examples in a moment about how you can kind of um, sophisticate your database a little bit more to help with the performance overall. Um, but that's just kind of a bit of an overview as to what you can do with bubble databases. One thing I'd recommend, and it's one thing I do in all of my tutorials that I create for my videos is I use Notion as a tool. I'm sure if you're using no code, you love it as much as me. Um, I'll normally create just a checklist in a Notion doc before I even start building my bubble app. And in that I'll highlight what the um, overlying data types will be. And then within that, I'll have bullet points of what all the data fields will be in that. And that way I really kind of format the structure of my database before I even jump into my editor and start creating anything. So I'd always recommend you do the same as well. Then after our database, I also wanna talk about the design canvas within Bubble. This is probably one of the most intuitive features to use in my opinion through Bubble. Um, so the design canvas is essentially what you see and how you can create an application. And I know that some no-code tools um, are quite restrictive in terms of where you can drag certain elements or components. Um, whereas Bubble themselves gives you full control over where you uh, add your elements, which can kind of be a blessing and a curse when it comes to responsive design. Um, but Bubble has a whole library of uh, elements that you can add, things like text, pictures, maps, videos, calendars, and you can also add additional um, elements through uh, plugins and integrations, so things like charts or payment portals and things like that. So the design canvas is really as limited as your imagination there. So within your design canvas, they break down, and I'll show you in a moment, they break down what particular elements you can add based on a couple of different properties. So you start with your visual elements, which are essentially just static elements that will display on your page. So let's say you wanna display some text, you can choose to add that element there. Um, but let's say if you want to start storing information within your application, there's some additional elements called input forms. So this allows you to add what's called like a text input. So someone can type into a field and then you can store that in your database. There's things like drop down menus, date time pickers, um, search boxes that you can customize and pull data from your database, uh, file uploaders even. Um, there's just, there's plenty of different ways that you can allow users to store data and information within your own database. Um, so that's why I normally recommend building out your database before you start actually designing your canvas. Um, so that way you know exactly what it is or what input forms you need to include on your page in order to reach the minimum features that you would like to build. But if I was to just give you a quick example, again, working around our Instagram clone here within the design canvas. So I've just got a very basic homepage here. Um, I've added in a static text element here, which just says Instagram. I've given it a custom font. Over here, I've added in some icons. Um, so you can just grab an icon and you can search through the icon library here. I've added in a couple, one for a user's profile, one to upload a particular post. Um, but let's say I'd like to add in a list of all the posts on our homepage. I can use what's called a repeating group element, which for some other people who are using different no-code tools might be called a list group. Um, but what a repeating group allows you to do is essentially display a list of anything you're storing within your database. So you can see here that it's formatted as different rows and cells. And for each row here, you can display a different entry that you're storing within your database. So the way I can integrate this with my database through our visual element is by linking this to a data type I have stored. So in this case, I'd like to display a list of the posts within my database. So I can select the post data type that I created before. And then let's say I just want to display a list of all the posts within my platform that have been created by users. I could 
update the data source here to search through our database and find all of the posts. And if I really wanted, I could add some what's called additional constraints. So I could add a constraint, for instance, to display only posts from uh, accounts that users are following or only posts from accounts where a user's location, where they published that post was in a certain range from the current user. You can really get as complex as you want with these. Um, but as it stands, I'm just going to, in this example today, pull through a list of all of the posts within our application. After I've updated this data source for this uh, particular element here, I can then update the style and the content that I would like to display. So I can update the number of rows that this uh, repeating group will display. And then within this, I can grab just a visual element here, which is an image, because I'd obviously like to display an image for every Instagram post. And then within this image, I can pull data from my database that's being sent through to this repeating group that it sits within. So in this case, because I'm pulling through a list of posts, I would like to display the image associated with each post in our database. So I can add dynamic data to this particular element here, and I can choose to display the current cell. So the particular um, post that's been displayed in this repeating group, I will choose to display its image. And now that will fetch the relevant data and display the image accordingly. And then below this, I could add in, let's say the user's name who published this post. Um, so if I was to do that, this is actually a good example here of um, how you can use a relational database. So let's say below this image here, and I apologize, I'm not focused at all about design right now, I'm a bit conscious of time. Um, but let's say I'd like to display the name of the person who created this post. But of course, our user data type and our post data type were completely separate. But this is where Bubbles relationship, um, sorry, relational database comes in help handy. Um, so if I insert dynamic data here and I'd like to display the name of the person who created this post, I could choose to pull the current cells post, so the post within this repeating group cell, the creator of that, so the person who uploaded this post, I could display their name, which is of course a data field that we added before. And now you can see how we can intertwine both of those different data types and display a list of relevant content. I'm just gonna jump back into my slide deck here. That's just a really brief example as to how you can start to customize your own uh, design canvas, particularly for our Instagram homepage there. Um, the possibilities are honestly endless as to what you can do within Bubble. Um, so yeah, I definitely always recommend just jumping in and experimenting with what you can find. The next thing, and this is probably one of my favorite things within Bubble, is the ability to create workflows. So I know that um, tools like Webflow, for instance, they allow you to integrate with other tools like App, uh, Zapier, which can then um, pull and store different data from like an Airtable database. Bubble allows you to essentially do the same thing, but completely within its own platform. Um, and workflows are essentially a way to create logic within your application, which is traditionally something that was obviously held only for developers to create through code. But essentially workflows, they allow you to create functions. So you could say, if X happens, then do Y. And then you can choose from a list of options or actions within your uh, bubble editor, much like you would in Zapier. So if you're familiar with Zapier, um, you could say when like a new entry in a Google Sheet is created, uh, send that data through to an email or something like that. Um, this is much the exact same as that, only you're doing it within Bubbles platform. The beauty though to workflows is that you can add conditions and constraints to these specific workflows. So you could say instead of if X do Y, you could say if X is A, but X is not B, then do Y. So you can really start to get particular about the particular, sorry, about the specific workflows um, that run within your application. And that's quite helpful if you're building an application for multiple users, um, because different users will have uh, different journeys within your application. So some people, let's say, if you're building a SaaS application, some people might be listed as admins, some people might be listed as editors. Um, so you can start creating permissions across different accounts. So you could say, if X, user is an editor but not an admin they can have these features but they can't do this particular functionality so that's where workflows can get quite powerful 
Um, but workflows allow you to essentially connect your visual element from your design canvas with the back end of your database that you create within Bubble. This is just an example of what a workflow looks like. And I'll be running you through a real case example of how we can create this within our Instagram clone here today. Um, but essentially this workflow here, um, I'll run you through every step of this process that's happening. Um, so at the moment, it's identifying only when the current user is logged in. So I'm referring to my Instagram clone again here in this use case. So when the current user is logged into an Instagram account, and they click a like icon, so a thumbs up icon or heart icon under a photo. I would like to add the current user to the person who's logged in that's liking that photo to a list of the post total likes. So if you remember in our database, I created the uh, data field which stored a list of users uh, as all the people who have liked that post. So in our bubble editor here, we have our workflow trigger. So when my icon, which is the like icon is clicked, I've selected an action below this to make changes to a thing. The thing I'll be changing is the post that the person is clicking on. And the data field within that post I'll be changing is the likes, which of course in our database was stored as a list of users. So I will be adding to it the current user. So the person who's logged in. And I've also added a condition to this workflow to only allow it to run if the current user is logged in. So let's say a user doesn't have an account or they're not logged in, this workflow won't run. And then I could create a separate workflow that could trigger a pop-up that says something like you need to register an account to uh, process this action. So if I'm to quickly just show you how you can build workflows in um, real time within Bubble, um, I apologize if I'm gonna kind of zip through this a little bit quickly. But let's say I'd like to build that exact workflow that I just showed you. So being able to create a like within an Instagram post here, I could choose to add an icon. Again, I am not too concerned about the design right now. Um, I would add a heart icon. And then when a user is scrolling through our application, they could click this icon. So when this happens, I would like that to be our workflow trigger. So I will select to start edit a workflow. I feel like anyone watching this recording is probably gonna cringe that I didn't update the name of that element, but that's all right. Um, and then once this workflow has triggered uh, or once this icon has been clicked, I'd like to add a condition to this to only allow it to run if the current user is logged in. So here I've got my trigger and here I've got an option to add a condition. So only when, and I can select only when the current user is logged in, this workflow will run. And then within our database, I'd like to select an action, choose from our data tab here. And I would like to make changes to something in our database because of course I'll be changing that post that the user is liking. So I'll select to make changes to a thing. The thing I would like to change is the current sales post. So the post in our repeating group that someone is selecting. And the data field I would like to change within this is the likes, which was registered as a list of users, if you remember in our database. And I'll be adding to it the current user. So the person who's logged in liking this post. But let's say I would also like to create a workflow that allows a user to unlike this post. So let's say they're scrolling through someone's feed 52 weeks deep, and then they've accidentally liked one of their ex's photos. What we'll need to do is create a workflow that allows them to now unlike that uh, post as well. So what I could do is create a separate workflow here. I will choose the same trigger. So when an element is clicked and the element will be our heart icon, but this time I'll be adding a condition to this workflow that only allows it to run when the current cells posts, it's list of likes, which again was stored as a list of users when this contains the current user. And when this is true, I would like to make changes in my database again. The thing I would like to change is once again, this post. And in this case, I would like to select the total uh, list of users who have liked this post. And I would like to now remove the current user from this. And you can really start to see how powerful these conditions can become because you can really start to gate certain features or make functionality a lot more intuitive for end users. 
And there's a ton of different conditions that I could add to these things. Like here, I would also be able to add um, when the person already has liked this post and they are logged in. Um, whereas here for our initial like, I could say when the current user's logged in and they haven't liked this post already, you allow that uh, workflow to run to then like that post. Um, but this is just a really quick example as to how you can get started building workflows within Bubble. Um, and you can quickly see how powerful the tool come when you really start to um, play around with it. Then after we've um, started getting familiar with workflows, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the integration side of Bubble. And this is one of my favorite aspects of Bubble as well. I mean, they're all my favorite aspects of Bubble. I'm very biased towards that. Um, but integrations really allow you to take your application to the next level. Um, so within Bubble, you can expand the capabilities of your platform, either through the Bubble plugin library or the API connector. So you can connect with essentially any third party service that has an API endpoint. Um, what I do love about the plugin library is that it gives you additional functionality through elements like graphs or anything. Um, but it also, a lot of the plugins um, take the manual work out of using a manual API connector. So I just made a tutorial the other week about how I could integrate Stripe Connect for marketplace payouts. Um, and instead of manually using the API connector, I just used a plugin that allowed me to integrate my Stripe account with my Bubble application. Um, and the best thing about integrations is that they remove the need to rely on other tools like Zapier. Although ironically, Bubble now has an integration with Zapier. Um, I think that, yeah, the use case for relying on their integrations is much more effective. So some examples of integrations you could use are things like processing payments with the Stripe plugin. Um, you can send text messages to users with the Twilio plugin. You can display charts and graphs, as I mentioned. Um, they already have pre-built Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn authentications that you can use. Things like a rich text editor, so users can mark up text and like bold it or um, change it to italics. Um, or of course, you can use their API connector, which allows you to integrate with other third party services. I just wanted to show you if you haven't used Bubble, uh, what the plugin library looks like. Again, I apologize if you already are using Bubble, this is gonna be very familiar for you. Um, and you're more than likely gonna be aware of what happens next when I select the Bubble plugins, I'll add a plugin, is a little bit slow to add plugins. Um, but let's say I'd like to search for Stripe plugin within my uh, plugin editor here. You can see that there's a list of a bunch of different Stripe um, plugins that allow me to uh, process different types of payments and different types of circumstances. Um, you can also see if I just go into the full library here, uh, just a list of all the other different types of um, different plugins you can use. So making things like draggable elements. I've used that when I was building a Trello clone to allow people to drag tasks between rows. Um, there's additional things like a multi-selector dropdown, uh, Discord integration. The list honestly just goes on. So before I about, uh, talk about how you can kind of uh, take the next step and become a power user, I just wanted to first identify how you can get started with Bubble. So if you haven't used Bubble before and you may be considering it, or if you're weighing up if the current tool set you're using now is um, how it's gonna compare to Bubble um, and you're ready to make the change, this is kind of my list of ways that I would recommend getting into Bubble. Um, so Bubble themselves has really put a lot of resources into creating some of their own um, video and written blog resources at the moment. Um, a really great example and a very hidden gem that I don't see many people using is the Bubble Academy. Um, it's filled with a ton of different uh, walkthroughs for their tool set. Um, but one of my favorite things is their fundamentals video series. So they have three of these and this is a video series and each of these is about five to 10 different videos. Um, but essentially each one gradually helps you learn Bubble in an engaging way. And I'm all for video um, because you can pause it, you can rewind it, you can really um, have someone explain it to you in real time um, at a pace that suits your own learning style. Um, so the three different fundamental series, if you go over to the Bubble Academy on their website, there's the 101, which is just the general introduction to core concepts. This one's very basic. Um, this is more for people who kind of haven't really heard of Bubble and what it can do. The 102 fundamentals though is where they really start to talk about um, 
what I've touched base on today, but in more depth. So they talk about all the different types of elements, how you can uh, leverage the most out of your database, how you can get the most out of your workflows. But one of my favorite ones is the 103 fundamentals because it walks you through the process of actually building your first app. So there's about 10 videos in this series. They're all quite in depth. And it literally walks you through the step-by-step -step process of creating a recipe directory. So it talks about how you can set up your database, how you can build the responsive design, how you can um, customize all your workflows that you need. And by the end of it, you actually have a working application that you can use. And these are all entirely free. So this is why I always recommend these resources to everyone. The other main resource, and I'm very biased in saying this, but it is the How to Build Blog series that I wrote for Bubble. Um, in all seriousness, this is a uh, really good way to get into Bubble if you are looking to build a specific thing. So as I mentioned, I find a lot of people want to start using Bubble, not to recreate an Instagram clone, um, but to actually just learn how to create a specific feature within Instagram. So whether it's liking posts, publishing something, or displaying a user's profile, um, this is a free series of written articles on Bubble's blog, and it just breaks down step-by-step -step written instructions as to how you can rebuild um, these particular uh, products within Bubble. The other way of getting started with Bubble is by far my favorite. It's just do it. Um, start by doing. Uh, I always say that Bubble clones are the best way to start because you don't need a product idea to start building something. Um, I know a lot of people are just interested in no code, but they don't know where to begin. I always recommend just starting to build clones because it'll give you an understanding of how you can create common features that you're most likely going to uh, recreate within your own application when it comes time. Um, if you get stuck along the way, use the Bubble Forum. It is an absolute dream. Um, there are so many active community members on there that will happily answer any of your question, uh, give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve problems. And it's already a repository of amazing insights about people who have already gone through the same process of you, who have had particular problems, and then they have community members solve those. So it saves you having to even ask a particular question in the beginning. And my other favorite method is just by doing, you get better 1% each day, which is kind of the motto for 100 days of no code, ironically. Um, so when I first started with Bubble, I didn't really know about this. And I feel like I did it before it was mainstream, but I did 100 days of no code by myself. Uh, in my room, it was about three and a half months, four months, I built my application for Dribble for Digital Marketers. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but yeah, it was about three or four months. And by the end of it, I had my dream working product um, functioning the exact way I wanted. I had a really great understanding and I built everything of the backbone of what I've learned in that time using that application. The best way to get started is really just by doing, diving in, getting your hands dirty, and don't be afraid to ask questions when you can. There's so many uh, great places for communities like 100 Days of No Code, Twitter, uh, the Bubble Forum. There's no shortage of people who are willing to reach out and help. The last thing I wanted to touch on is becoming a power user within Bubble. So let's say you get the basics down and you're really interested in uh, taking your application to the next level. Um, there's a few specific things I would recommend uh, to help you get the most out of your own Bubble experience. And I apologize if you're new to Bubble, you haven't heard of Bubble, these might be a little bit confusing or overwhelming. But the first one I recommend is sharding your database. And what I mean by this is splitting your data types into as many different data types as possible. So in my example today, I gave you um, a walkthrough of how we could create an Instagram clone. And when I was creating my database, I had my users, my posts, and that was it. What I would recommend doing is if you have your posts, let's say in your data type, and then within that, you've got a data field, which is your images. Then you've got your likes, you've got the creator of that, you've got um, the name of the person who created that. Um, all of this data really does add up when you start to store it in your database. And I know scalability is a really sensitive topic when it comes to no-code tools. Although in my opinion, I think it is definitely getting better. Um, but what I would recommend doing is uh, sharding your database. So for your post data type, you could split that into two different data types. So you could have your post and then you could have the content of the post. And the post itself, the main data type would be what you show in your actual homepage. Um, so this could just be like an overview of some really basic data. So like who the creator of it was, the like count of it, um, any other additional information that you need to um, allow the user to see something to begin with. 
Um, and then in order to, so you're not loading an image every single time you need to pull out a post from your database, you could split the post image as a separate data type, not just a data field, and you could connect the two. So that way you're only then loading the post images whenever you actually need them, as opposed to just telling the bubble editor to load all posts with all the images, particularly with images, files, and videos, they're going to really overwhelm the editor and slow applications down. I've been burnt before in the past doing that. Um, so it's definitely recommended that you start sharding your database into different data types. There's plenty of great um, kind of uh, resources, eBooks that I've seen out there that really talk about how you can do this in best practice as well. So I recommend checking those out. Um, another great tool that I use all the time is custom states within Bubble. And this really does remind me of using hooks within React. Um, if you're not familiar with that, custom states and hooks allow you to store and pass data through particular elements on your page. So let's say you've got a group on your page or a repeating group, which I mentioned is like a list group. Um, you can store custom data and custom parameters within that particular element. So that way you're not pulling data from your database, which means that you one, have to store less data in your database. So your application is gonna be faster. And then two, um, you can, just pull that data whenever you need it, as opposed to having to load all that data through your database as well. And then another hot topic is responsive design. Um, I know this one's a little bit confusing. Um, there's plenty of great tutorials out there, particularly from Greg at BuildCamp. He's doing an amazing job talking about responsive design. Um, I would also keep an eye out for Bubble. They're releasing a new responsive engine who knows when at this point, um, but it's gonna be using the Flexbox, which is similar to uh, Webflow. So it's from my understanding going to be a lot more intuitive, um, but it's definitely easy to create a powerful application in Bubble, but although it will be powerful, you need to make sure it is obviously um, a really nice user experience for your end users as well. So responsive design is a big one that you will need to master eventually. Um, and then there's the thing like the API connector and creating your own custom integrations to pull external data. So a good example is I was building a trading app um, for a bubble tutorial, um, which was just like Apple stocks. So that's where you log into an app and you see a price of all these stocks in real time. Um, and I was able to use an external API to connect with a um, essentially a library of real time stock data information. And I could just integrate that with bubble easily and update that in real time. Um, so whenever you use logged in, they would see the most relevant information about that stock price. But that's essentially everything I wanted to cover today. Um, I apologize if there isn't anything I haven't covered yet, which is why I wanna give a little bit of time for questions. On the other side, I also hope I haven't overwhelmed anyone. I think Bubble is a really powerful tool to get started. Um, and it definitely has its perks and its drawbacks, just like every other tool out there on the market. I'm open to questions if anyone has any. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Lachlan. That was really useful. Um, yeah, feel free to fire away, guys. Um, yeah, pick uh, Lachlan's brains. <laughs> I, I, oh, Kelly, all yours. Yeah, so my, my question is about, like, I, I think some people are sort of system type of brains, and some people are like, maybe more creative brain type or you know what I mean like I think that systems thinking and data structure is a really either you kind of have it or you don't or maybe you have a background in development so it makes sense because you've learned it so I'm guessing I, I guess my question is sort of like do you recommend sort of reading up on how to structure data or how to think that way or like I don't know I imagine that could be really hard it's a great question into. yeah um, I honestly didn't put any time to thinking about this when I started Bubble, and I think now it is because I'm a bit of a systems person. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but again, I honestly believe the best way to learn is just by building. You will quickly realize if you built your database wrong, because it will slow down within a week of adding data to it. Um, the best way to learn is baptism by fire. Just fail, fail quickly. Um, that being said, definitely read up. Absolutely. Um, there's, I use Twitter religiously. I'm not too sure if you do as well, but um, yeah, like try and follow kind of the key players within the bubble space. Um, they're very proactive in terms of the resources they create. They'll create eBooks, video tutorials. Um, I kind of do the same, um, but also bubble themselves will um, 
every month they release a post on their forum, which just gives an update as to everything that they're doing um, and all the new tools and that that they're creating. And within that, if they, let's say, deploy like a new update that enhances speed, they'll also link back to previous posts that talk about how you can create faster applications. So like, just really like keep an eye out on the right places. I think um, the information is definitely out there, but um, my best advice, honestly, is like, it's, it's going to seem very counterintuitive, but just do it yourself. <laughs> like figure, like you, you will get better with practice, which is the whole hundred days of no code. Like there is a reason why it's a hundred days. Like these tools are easy, but like, they're not just a walk in the park still. Like these are real tools building real apps. So yeah, definitely practice is the best way to get perfect. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to ask one from Rashika um, around uh, uh, sort of the database holding, like is, is Bubble the, like the place to be holding like large sums of data or, or do, do you, should you be hosting it somewhere else? Um, or does it not really matter? I have two kind of arguments for this. One is yes or no. So I apologize. It's not going to be a direct answer, but I will try and get to there in the end. Um, so it is a tough topic, scalability, especially in bubble. Um, it really will depend on how you structure your database. So if you split, as I mentioned, your data types into as many separate data types as possible, it will definitely go further. That being said, I have definitely run into a scenario where I had like massive image and video files for like thousands of users. And it definitely did slow down over time. There are tools now like Xeno, which is like a, a database as a service. So it is um, like a, a back endless database that allows you to just connect through Bubbles API. From what I understand, I haven't used it yet. I apologize, but it's much faster to just run things that way. I'm actually shared a link next to that. Um, yeah, it's a much better way if you're looking at long term. My other argument, and this is probably very counterintuitive to other startup or product advice you've probably heard, is don't worry about it yet. I could tell you how many times I've spent building like months building applications that I think like is going to work. It's going to scale. I need to worry about these features and literally two people used it. And my mom's probably one of them. So you need to not worry about that until it's a problem, which of course that is the counter arguments with that about like tech debt and like how much that will be. I think like there is a fine line where you do need to be thinking about it and just know that there are tools out there that can do it like Xenix, uh, Xeno, sorry. Um, worst case scenario, you could also just like, if you really wanted to, um, just like host your own AWS, like Lambda instance, like you have the API connected to be able to do that as well. So I think scalability is an okay thing with Bubble. Um, whether or not you reach that maximum scale, you will have a solution for it. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's definitely one of those, it depends uh, sort of questions. They uh, all it depends yeah. questions. It's a horrible <laughs> because like, I hate when I like people give it depends questions. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, Cool. Um, and I see we've hit the hour, maybe time for one more question. Um, uh, yeah, before we wrap up, because I know it's getting a little bit late where you are, uh, Lachlan. So uh, yeah, feel free to come off mute anyone. Um. <laughs> we'll cool. just note that um, my DMs are always open on Twitter. Um, my email address is always awesome. out there as well too. So if you have any questions at all, um, even if you're just building something cool, like tag me, I'd love to see it. I'm always excited to see what people are building within Bubble. Um, so yeah, I mean, even if it's not Bubble, I just love no code. So tag <laughs> me in whatever you're building, a dollar Webflow, Zapier, I want to see it. Let me, I'll drop the link. And is there any closing words you want to share, Lachlan, with that, um, to, you know, sending people to building with Bubble? I think I've actually already sent the link, so you're all good, but you can say it again, yeah. Whatever, any closing words would be amazing. Um. My best advice is, yeah, to just start by doing. Um, I think that's the only way that I got into it. And that's kind of my personal approach to a lot of the things that I've learned with no code. And I mean, also building a business, that's another story. Um, but yeah, just um, try and use all those resources I shared. Um, I mean, I'd love to plug mine, but they're all paid resources. I think you can get some, like you can get quite far with all the free resources that Bubbles put out there. They're a million dollar startup, like they're paying to use these resources. So definitely make the most of those while you can. Mm. Um, but yeah, just try and, Make the hundred days, um, get through as much as you can and build as much as you can in that time. Mm. Awesome. Um, very wise words to, to end on. Um, awesome. Cool. Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming and uh, I'll see you uh, on Twitter and Slack and elsewhere. Um, but thanks again, Lachlan. Really appreciate it. Been, been an immense presentation.
Thank you. Catch you guys. I appreciate yeah. it. Cheers. Bye-bye.